called to order the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. We want to thank everybody for joining us this morning to uh, talk about the incredible potential of uh, Americans for us to help solve the climate crisis. And we have a number of members involved in really important leadership work on this issue. Covering more than one third of the land area of the United States, our public and private forests already play an important role storing carbon. And with the right policies, they have the potential to do so much more. Mother Nature couldn't have designed a more effective mechanism for sequestering carbon and cleaning our air. America's forests currently pull as much carbon dioxide out of the air every year as eliminating 54 million cars from the road, according to the National Academy of Sciences. And just as a caveat, as somebody who makes vehicles, we'd still like you to buy vehicles. But, uh, but that's very, very significant, um, what the, our forests alone can do. Climate smart forestry policies offer both tools to reduce carbon pollution and an important opportunity mm -hmm to develop new revenue streams for family foresters. This helps provide financial stability in uncertain times as pressure increases to subdivide forest land for new development. But our solutions can't be one size fits all, as we know. Small acreage, minority land owners have too often been left out of the kind of opportunities we're talking about today. Their stories are unique, and their needs may be very different than those of larger or more resourced operations. We have a duty to bring all voices to the table. And we have witnesses with us today who can speak to how we can do more to address the needs of these foresters specifically. We also have to invest in our national forests, both in replanting stands that have been affected by wildfire, and insect outbreaks, and in pursuing science-based restoration of our public lands to help prevent wildfires in the first place. Senator Bennett, who chairs our forestry subcommittee, and whose beautiful home state of Colorado last year saw some of the worst wildfires in recent history, is leading a bill on this. And I look forward to working with you, Senator Bennett. As we work to better manage our forest to help us reach our climate goals, we have to think about a variety of different principles to help guide the discussion. First, we need to ensure that climate smart forestry policies and practices complement and strengthen our traditional forest products markets. In fact, I think there's great promise in storing carbon in long lived wood products like mass timber. We worked in a bipartisan way in the last Farm Bill to enact my Timber Innovation Act and my alma mater, Michigan State University, is building the first mass timber building in the state of Michigan. And I understand, Senator Bozeman, that you have a large construction project, at least one, in Arkansas as well. We must look for additional opportunities to build markets for climate-friendly forestry products. Secondly, as we think about reaping additional climate benefits from managed timberland, we also need to redouble our efforts to protect the few remaining stands of old growth forests. These mature forests are tremendous carbon reserves, and they ought to be preserved, both for the climate and for other benefits, like providing wildlife habitat and clean water. A diverse coalition of forest landowners, industry, conservationists, outdoor recreation enthusiasts agree that voluntary, flexible policies and investments to drive carbon smart Climate smart forestry practices are a win-win. My Rural Forest Markets Act with Senator Braun, along with the Replant Act with Senator Portman and Senators Bennett, Marshall, uh, Senate Bennett and Marshall, are examples of bipartisan bills that positively address these issues. I know we'll hear strong support for both pieces of legislation today, as well as other opportunities in this arena. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. We thank each of you for being with us. And with that, I would recognize my friend and our ranking member, Senator Bozeman, for his comments. Thank you, Chairwoman Stabenow, for your interest and commitment in continuing this important conversation focusing on the forestry sector. I appreciate the collaboration for today's hearing and thank our witnesses for their time today. 
I look forward to today's conversation because the forest sector and the wood products industries have a great story to tell when it comes to the numerous benefits healthy working forests provide, including carbon sequestration. The good news is we have an abundance of the world's greatest carbon sequestration machines, trees. Using Forest Service data, the Environmental Protection Agency declared U.S. forest carbon stocks contained 58.7 billion metric tons of carbon in 2019. U.S. forests were also a net carbon sink of 221 million metric tons of carbon in 2019, offsetting approximately 12 percent of gross annual greenhouse gas emissions in the United States for the year. 12 percent. It's amazing. While this is encouraging, we cannot simply plant more trees and expect an end to the conversation. Planting trees without an appropriate and active management is the equivalent to planting mountains of kindling across our public and private forest lands. The good news is that America's foresters, public and private land management experts, and the wood products industry know how to maintain, cultivate, and sustain healthy forests today and for generations to come. This life cycle of planting trees, managing forests, harvesting timber, and delivering this commodity to a vibrant wood products industry is a win-win for everyone. Our forests win from active management and treatments that help mitigate against pests and diseases and minimize the severity and intensity of catastrophic wildfires. Healthy, well-managed forests provide cleaner air and water and vibrant ecosystems for wildlife and recreation activities. This is a win for all of us. When we manage our forests properly, we can harvest desirable timber, continue reforestation activities, and support the growing wood products industry, which sequesters carbon in products beyond the life of the individual tree. This is a win for public and private forest lands, our wood products industry, and for the economic sustainability of rural communities relying on this industry for their livelihood. The common denominator in achieving these wins is management. Providing forestry experts the right tools yields us healthy forests, healthy markets, and countless benefits. According to the American Forest and Paper Association, the forest products industry employs over 900,000 people and supports 2.5 million jobs through its supply chain. The industry represents around 4% of the U.S. manufacturing gross domestic product and manufactures almost $300 billion in products annually. This industry and these jobs are essential to rural economies. In Arkansas, we're seeing some of the exciting innovations of mass timber. For instance, the University of Arkansas's Adoe Hall is a 202,000 square foot student residence constructed almost entirely of mass timber. It is one of the largest mass timber buildings in the United States, estimating to store the equivalent of over 3,000 metric tons of carbon. Also, Walmart is constructing a new corporate headquarters in Bentonville with 1.7 million cubic feet of mass timber harvested and manufactured in Arkansas. As a result of that project, uh, Structure Lamb will be opening a new facility in Conway, Arkansas that will create over 100 new jobs in the state. These projects are a microcosm of the win-win opportunities tied to healthy, well-managed working forests and there are many success stories to be told. As Congress and the administrations consider strategies to promote voluntary participation <clears throat> in combating climate change, we must avoid policies that take forest land out of production or deter sound management practices. We must ensure foresters and landowners are able to operate with certainty, predictability, and transparency, and we must avoid taking actions that may disrupt this cycle and sustainable market cycle. This is true with the administration's tax proposal on capital gains and stepped-up basis, which may have significant implications for the agriculture and forestry industries by frustrating rather than facilitating market opportunities for landowners, timber harvest, and the wood products industries, which is why I encourage our stakeholders to examine these tax proposals and consider how they impact operations today and will for future generations. We need to keep our forests working and not pursue policies or incentivized practices that may impede the great story of our forest and wood products industries. With that, I am eager to hear 
the unique interest from our witnesses today to better understand the winds. Healthy working forests provide by sequestering carbon, supporting our rural communities, and our growing wood products industry. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Well, thank you very much, Senator Bozeman. Uh, appreciate working with you on the hearing and on this really important issue. I know we share uh, a desire to to do positive things in this area. So now let me uh, begin. We'll introduce all five of our witnesses first and then come back and ask uh, each of our witnesses to share uh, five minutes of testimony. And then of course, we're very interested in what other information you'd like to provide us in writing as well today. Uh, let me start with Kedron Dillard, uh, a fourth generation forest landowner in Brunswick County, Virginia. Ms. Dillard is part of a network of landowners with the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Network and a board member of the American Forest Foundation. In addition to her expertise on forestry and climate matters, she has particular experience with heirs property issues, working to clarify and document the ownership of her family's land, resulting in more than 250 descendants. Today, Ms. Dillard and her family continue to work on improving the health of their forests to ensure that their land will benefit generations to come. Next, let me introduce Mr. Troy Harris. I know that uh, uh, Senator Warnock had uh, hoped that he would be able to give this introduction, and uh, I know he's working to get here to uh, the, the committee today, but I'm gonna proceed on his behalf. Uh, Troy Harris is the Managing Director of Jamestown Timberland Investment Management Organization in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a certified forester, serves on the Operating Committee of the National Alliance of Forest Owners, is a member of the Forest Landowners Association and the Georgia Forestry Association. Mr. Harris has more than 25 years experience in timberland portfolio management. I now want to recognize Senator Bozeman, who will introduce our next witnesses. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to introduce Ms. Jessica Orego, Director of Forestry of the American Cat Carbon Registry at Winrock International, Little Rock, Arkansas. Ms. Orego is currently the American Carbon Registry Director of Forestry at Winrock International. She is responsible for the listing verifying and registering of carbon projects under compliance and voluntary carbon markets. Ms. Rego has experience in, in project development, consulting, and implementation for a wide range of climate-focused entities, including the Plan Vivo Foundation, U.S. Climate Change Science Program, and Eco Securities. In her previous roles, she worked to develop protocols, projects, and climate research coordination. Ms. Rego has a bachelor's degree in biology and master's degree in, in forestry from the University of Vermont. Welcome, Ms. Jessica Rego. Thank you so much for participating in today's hearing. Next, I'd like to introduce another uh, Arkansan, Mr. Joe Fox, our state forester, uh, president of the National Association of State Foresters, from Little Rock, Arkansas. Mr. Fox is the state forester for Arkansas, a role held since 2012 in the forestry division of the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. He is the current president of the National Association of State Foresters. Before coming to the department, Mr. Fox was the director of conservation forestry for the Arkansas Field Office of the Nature Conservancy. He has experience in forest project development, conservation planning, and land acquisition. Previously, he spent 20 years working in a family-owned lumber business. He holds two bachelor's degrees in forestry and agriculture economics. Joe has done a tremendous job for the state of Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. Fox, for participating, and welcome. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I'll turn to Senator Bennett. I do have to make a note that Senator Bennett had two witnesses, I think, at the last hearing. <laughs> Senator We're Bozeman. down to one. Yeah, I know. And Senator Bozeman had two this time. I, I've got to work on Michigan here. We've got to make sure more, <laughs> more members we are will help getting you people that. to come in from their state. So, uh, Senator Bennett. Th thank you, Chairwoman Stabenow uh, and Ranking Member Bozeman. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to introduce Dr. Tony Cheng. Dr. Cheng is the director of the Colorado 
Forest Restoration Institute. He's also a professor of an, an extension specialist in forest and rangeland stewardship at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. He holds a master's in forestry from the University of Minnesota and a PhD. Okay, I know, you can't get through it. I know. Excuse the me, bit, I don't the think- The highest <laughs> voter turnout in the country. Okay. Uh, he holds a master's in forestry from the University of Minnesota and a PhD in forestry from Oregon State University. For over 20 years, Dr. Chang has worked in Colorado and across the West at the intersection of academic research and practical forest management. In his role leading CFRI, Dr. Cheng works with land managers, collaborative groups, and local interests to develop science-based forest management strategies to restore landscapes and manage fire risk with a focus on national forest lands. During my time in the Senate, I've relied on Dr. Cheng over and over again for his insights and expertise. In 2014, I asked him to co-lead a group of forestry experts to tell us how to better support forest health and wildfire recovery efforts in Colorado. These recommendations guided our work to reauthorize CFLRP in the 2018 Farm Bill, improve wildfire recovery funding, and finally end fire borrowing. Last fall, I asked Dr. Cheng to join a group of Colorado businesses, county commissioners, water leaders, and conservationists to develop policy recommendations for building climate resist resilience in the West. One of the group's top recommendations was investing in the forest and watershed health. And just a few weeks ago, Dr. Cheng and I were together with Secretary Vilsack and Governor Polis looking at forest health treatments in Colorado's Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest. So I'm grateful for Dr. Cheng's leadership and guidance on these issues over the years, and I'm honored to welcome him to the committee today. Well, thank you very much, Senator Bennett. We'll turn to our witnesses. I do want to reassure our witnesses, we will not harass you. We only harass each other on the committee. Yes. So, uh, so uh, very pleased uh, to have, we'll start with Ms. Dillard. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Sustainable Forestry and African-American Land Retention Network, SFLR, and the American Forest Foundation. As you consider climate policy in this committee and in this Congress, please consider policies that recognize the important role and opportunity African-American forest owners like my family, as well as other family forest owners have in contributing to climate solutions. In addition to helping reduce carbon emissions, climate policy should give landowners the tools and support to tackle the impacts of climate change on our land with voluntary efforts that increase our land's value help us keep our land in the family and keep it forested and healthy. Family and individual forest donors own more than one third of U.S. forests, making us essential in efforts to mitigate climate change. America's forests already capture and store nearly 15% of annual U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. We can do much more with our forests if we empower family forest owners, including African-American owners like me, with the right tools and policy support. I am a proud fourth generation forest landowner. With my family, we own approximately 100 acres of land in three small farmland plots in Brunswick County, located in Southern Virginia. Luckily, our titles are clear on all three properties now, but this took a great deal of work and money, paying the legal fees and buying out all 250 heirs to a portion of this land. With the help of the Black Family Land Trust and SFLR network organization, to date, we've been able to keep the land in the family. We are fortunate to work through these heirs' property issues and land ownership concerns, but now, but know that many other African-American landowners with long and emotional ties to the land have not been so fortunate. Heirs' property combined with the lack of access and trust in institutions that support landowners have led to significant loss of African-American and other minority land ownership. On our land, we harvest timber to pay for the upkeep and management of expenses, but this is not nearly enough to cover all our costs forcing my family and I to absorb the remaining expenses out of pocket. There will come a time when fewer family members will share in these costs and it will be too much of a burden to bear by only a few. This will undoubtedly jeopardize keeping my land family owned and in forest. As a result, we are actively looking for additional opportunities to help the land pay for itself. And in parallel, identify management efforts that are both good for the climate and for the long-term health of our forest. USDA conservation programs can certainly help. 
However, carbon markets present a near-term solution to this challenge for my family and other neighboring landowners who cannot afford management on their own. Carbon markets can help bring private sector money, some estimate in the billions, to family forests like mine. While we would like to enroll our land in a carbon market, the opportunities are few and far between as most carbon markets favor large lands over small family-owned forests like ours. Individual carbon projects on small for forests are extremely costly and complex, making carbon markets largely out of scope for me and other owners like myself. There are significant upfront costs for developing a carbon project and implementing forest management practices that do not return revenues from the sale of carbon until years later. Most families simply do not have the resources for upfront expenses and the ability to wait years for a return. I want to thank Senator Stabnow and Braun for introducing the Rural Forest Markets Act as a solution to overcome these barriers and help family forest owners access carbon markets. This bill unlocks private capital that can finance the high upfront cost of entering a carbon market and can be paid as carbon is generated and sold from forest carbon actions over time. This bill will help family forest owners like me participate in carbon markets, earn revenue for needed forest management that benefits the climate, something I could not do, I could not afford to do without this bill, and brings billions in private sector resources to small farming families like mine. I respectfully urge further improvement of the bill to ensure historically underserved landowners including African-American landowners who face significant barriers in market participation can take part in these opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity to share my views and my story. I look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much. We'd now like to turn to Mr. Troy Harris. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Stubbenow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and distinguished members of the Senate Agricultural Committee. On behalf of Jamestown, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Jamestown's a global design-focused real estate investment and management company with a 37-year track record and a clear mission to transform spaces into innovation hubs and community centers. We employ more than 400 people worldwide with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, and Cologne, Germany. Since 2009, Jamestown has owned and managed timberlands in the Eastern United States, including timberland in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York, and Indiana. We take great pride in managing our forests using sustainably forest sustainable forestry practices. In 2020, Jamestown made a pledge to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and to cut our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. I'm a forester by training, and so I'm proud of the contributions our Timberland make to our company's emissions reduction goals. Today, I'd like to talk about the bigger picture, how our country's working forests are contributing to climate mitigation. One, of, one out of every three acres in the United States is covered by forests, and 67% of U.S. forests are working forests. Working forests are forests sustainably managed to deliver a steady, renewable supply of wood for building materials and more than 5,000 items that consumers use every day. The U.S. is a global leader in sustainable forestry management, providing clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, and rural jobs. Harvests occur on only about 2% of our total land area on private working forests each year, and that same amount of acreage is regrown each year. Forests are the optimal land use for maximizing carbon storage. Privately owned working forests provide approximately 90% of our wood and fiber needs, yet they also return and account for 73% of our gross annual forest, forest carbon sequestration enough offset emissions from all passenger vehicles in the U.S. each year. Private working forests also store more carbon than all other U.S. forests combined. The forest sector is already carbon negative. Forests sequester more carbon than it's emitted from forest harvest operations and forest products manufacturing together, in fact, 16 times more. The data, data clearly show that working forests can produce products while supporting rural jobs and benefiting the climate. And there's room to do more. And we've set a path to get there as a, as, as, as a forest sector. James sounds a member of the National Alliance of Forest Land Owners. I recently joined NAFO and the CEOs of, of 42 other forest owning companies, as well as the CEOs of the Environmental Defense Fund and the Nature Conservancy 
to adopt a unique set of principles on private working forests as a natural climate solution. NAFO has carried these ideas through the broader stakeholder groups, in particular, the Forest Climate Working Group, the unified voice across US forest sector on climate policy. The built environment is one place where sustainable forest products can produce clear climate winds. According to the United Nations, traditional building materials account for roughly 11% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Building with wood can sustainably reduce that number and mass timber buildings, buildings made with structural timber, make more wood intensive buildings possible. Jamestown recently announced plans to construct a 100,000 square foot office building from mass timber targeting lead gold at Pont City Market in Atlanta, Georgia. While Jamestown has been an early adopter, we're not alone. Michigan State University is a pioneer in the research and adoption of mass timber. They built the first mass timber building in Michigan and Walmart's commitment to mass timber for their headquarters spurred a $90 million investment in a new mass timber production facility in rural Arkansas. But the U.S. is behind on mass timber production and use. This is where the committee can help. This committee has three clear pathways to further climate smart policies in our sector. First, you can expand markets for forest carbon, increasing accessibility and credibility. Second, you can encourage more sustainable sourced wood construction by building on the Timber Innovation Act. Whole building life cycle analysis can lead to carbon reductions in the whole built environment, not only in wood. And third, you can improve forest carbon data. Markets for forest carbon and climate smart construction need data to prove climate benefits with greater precision. The US government can collect and give credibility to data so that markets, forest owners and consumers all have faith in it. Private working forests are already doing a lot for the climate and they can do even more. Thank you for your time and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Jessica Orego, welcome. Chairwoman Sabinow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting the American Carbon Registry to testify today on this important topic. We are at a critical inflection point in the history of forest carbon markets in the US. With demand for high quality carbon credits taking off, today's hearing comes at the right time. My name is Jessica Orego, and I am the Director of Forestry at the American Carbon Registry, or ACR which is a nonprofit enterprise of Winrock International and was founded in 1996 as the first private voluntary greenhouse gas registry in the world. In both the voluntary carbon market and California's regulated carbon market, ACR oversees the registration and verification of carbon offset projects, which follow approved carbon accounting methodologies. And we issue serialized offsets on a transparent registry system. The main forest project types in the U.S. are improved forest management, or IFM, reforestation, and avoided conversion. The vast majority of U.S. forest carbon projects are IFM. The first message that I'd like to leave you with today is that a vibrant U.S. forest carbon market exists, which is already delivering carbon finance to a vast diversity of landowners. The U.S. forest carbon market includes more than 200 projects on more than 7 million acres across the country, and have issued close to 200 million tons of CO2 emission reductions in the last decade. Projects are located in almost every forested region of the US and almost every type of forest ownership class is represented in the carbon market, including industrial landowners, conservation organizations, family forest owners and tribes. We are now seeing some state and municipal forests enter the market as well. The U.S. forest carbon has issued credits valued at almost $2 billion to forest landowners in the past 10 years. Carbon revenue is directly helping landowners meet a number of land management objectives, ranging from tribes using carbon finance to purchase ancestral lands or improve fire management, to companies using the finance to help manage land more sustainably or to assist in conservation goals, or even to pay for small landowners insurance or taxes or other family expenditures. I'll give three brief examples. Across the country, state, county, and local governments own more than 80 million acres of timberland. 
sets an area larger than New Mexico and represents huge potential for a new area of climate action. Michigan's Department of Natural Resources has already begun implementing the first state agency-led carbon project on commercially managed state forests. Tribes have also entered the U.S. carbon markets with more than 20 indigenous groups directly benefiting from carbon finance. Finally, another area for growth in the carbon market is small-scale forest owners. Less than 1% of these forest owners currently participate in the carbon market, even though they own nearly 40% of the forests in the United States. Luckily, this is changing and there are now emerging approaches to make the market more accessible to this important forest ownership class. The second message that I would like to leave you with is that demand for carbon credits is rapidly increasing and will continue to rise with US forest owners well positioned to benefit. But that, that, but that the basis of this growth must be built on integrity. More than 1500 companies have now set net zero targets and demand for offsets is exponentially increasing to new record levels. This is good news for the US forest carbon market but as demand for offsets grows, so too is demand for integrity. Companies want to know that their investments are leading to real results. The final message is that there is no need to start from scratch or reinvent the wheel. The market and related infrastructure is already in place and is rapidly evolving and expanding to offer more opportunities. Disruption to the existing carbon market could have adverse effects on investments private capital, and on landowners and other stakeholders already participating in this market. It is our hope that the government will support the growth and scaling of the forest carbon offsets market by working with the current market stakeholders and within the existing processes and frameworks. We look forward to working together to maintain momentum, to increase benefits for all kinds of forest landowners, and to adhere to high standards and integrity. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd now like to hear from Mr. Joe Fox. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Stabenow and Ranking Member Bozeman and members of the committee for holding the hearing today and for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Association of State Foresters. I'm Joe Fox, Arkansas State Forester and NASF President. NASF represents the directors of forestry agencies in all 50 states, eight territories, and the District of Columbia. State foresters deliver technical and financial assistance to private landowners who own about half of all the forests in the U.S. We also partner with federal land management agencies through cooperative agreements and good neighbor authority to help manage national forests and conduct wildfire operations nationwide. State forestry agencies are uniquely positioned to address climate change, promote forest carbon sequestration efforts, and ensure greater forest resilience. One role that we play is that of advocate. We advocate for the inclusion of active forest management in federal climate change policy and programming. There are many existing federal programs that could enhance the role of forests as carbon sinks with additional funding and higher prioritization. They include the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and the Forest Stewardship Program, and there's others. These programs serve to increase carbon storage by helping to improve the condition of our forest and maximize wood availability for forest products utilization. As you all know, forest products like forests themselves act as carbon sinks and have demonst demonstrative climate benefits in many different applications, including building construction and energy generation. The efficacy of forest and forest products in addressing climate change depends on forest sustainability. Without active management, forests are less resilient to climate change and less effective at sequestering carbon. As state foresters, we know active forest management looks different in different forest types, different regions, and different communities. In Arkansas, where I'm a state forester, we harvested over 24 million tons of wood in the from the state's 19 million acres in 2019. It was a record year for us and data from the U.S. Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis Program shows our annual growth exceeded our harvest and mortality rates by 20 million tons. In some locales, harvesting trees on the scale we do in Arkansas isn't feasible. Nine times out of 10, this is because there aren't enough markets for forest landowners to sell their timber into. 
This brings me to a critical point I want to stress to the committee. Forest markets for both wood and carbon credits are critical to maintaining the health and sustainability of forests in the U.S. Wood markets in particular enable the carefully planned harvest of trees that is needed for forests to have appropriate stocking levels, balanced age classes, and species diversity. These managed forests are healthy forests, better able to withstand wildfire and pest, and more capable of providing clean air and clean water, wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities, and the countless other benefits of forests. In addition to promoting active forest management with federal programming and policy, this committee can support forest-based climate strategies by championing coordinated wildfire mitigation. To maintain our forests as carbon sinks, we can't let them be destroyed by out of control wildfires. We must reduce wildfire fuel loads in our forests. With thinnings, harvests, prescribed fire, whatever the treatment is critical that hazardous fuels are reduced on at least 5 million acres each year, in addition to what we treat now. The Forest Service and NASF agree it will cost about $60 billion over the next 10 years to meet this goal. By making such significant investments in wildfire mitigation, this body can help maintain our forests as carbon sinks, create green jobs nationwide, and protect Americans from catastrophic wildfire. In closing, addressing climate change requires collaboration. NAS is, NASF is a member of the Forest Climate Working Group to advance climate solutions. I want to thank you all for your bipartisan work on climate solutions. To quote the Texas State Forester, trees are the answer. What's your question? I look forward to answering your questions today and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Tony Chang, welcome. Chair Wubin Samanow, ranking, ranking Member Boozman, and members of the committee, thank you very much for your invitation for me to speak today. The Colorado Forest Restoration Institute that I direct is one of three Southwest Ecological Restoration Institutes authorized by Congress back in 2004. CFRI is one of many programs at Colorado State University that develop and apply science-based decision support systems to address climate change for agriculture, natural resources, and forestry. Another example this committee may be familiar with is the Comet Project, uh, which is developed by my CSU Soils and Crops colleagues in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm here today to share a Western perspective on this hearing's topic. And, I will note that there are many perspectives, but with a focus on the Rocky Mountain West, where federal forests are prevalent and are being impacted by a succession of wildfires, insect outbreaks, and prolonged droughts. I'll summarize my written testimony here in three points. My first, <clears throat> my first point is that climate change is delivering a double blow to Western federal forests. The first hit is what scientists are calling compounding disturbances, where prolonged droughts, insect outbreaks, and wildfires are impacting forests at the same time, causing much of their stored carbon to be released into the atmosphere, especially in the form of wildfire smoke that we had uh, been impacted by for uh, uh, last summer. The second hit is that the changing climate is inhibiting forest regeneration after wildfires in many areas. Forest recovery could take centuries, if at all. In the meantime, this green infrastructure to mitigate climate change has been lost. My second point is that the work needed to make Western federal forests more resilient off involves a portfolio of actions that can take many years to accomplish. Multi-year funding programs, such as the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program and Joint Chiefs Partnership, provide the stability and certainty needed by forest managers and their partners to plan and implement work at the scale needed to make an impact. And Senator Bennett saw the results of this work firsthand in Northern Colorado during his visit to the Cameron Peak Fire a couple of weeks ago. I wanna acknowledge and credit the work of this committee to reauthorize the CFLR program in fiscal year 2018. The Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership Act that Senator Bennett and Senator Hoven introduced earlier this month would provide a substantial boost to the long-term investments needed to achieve work at this scale. Restarting those western forests not regenerating after wildfires will also be a long-term proposition. 
the proposed replant act introduced by Senator Sabanow and Senator Portman and his companion bill in the house would provide the US Forest Service with the needed resources to plant well over a billion trees in the next decade. My third and last point is that sustaining Western federal forest as green infrastructure requires sustaining a corresponding social infrastructure across the West. Representatives from various government, non-governmental, community-based, and private sector entities are working collaboratively to craft and implement portfolios of climate forward forest management work that are, that are based in locally relevant science, tailored to the specific ecological, economic, and social context, and collectively monitored to ensure that outcomes are being met. This front-end collaboration can be thought of as an essential social infrastructure to make our forest resilient. However, the costs of sustaining this collaboration are not explicitly funded. Programs like CFLRP and Joint Chiefs dedicate funding for implementing shovel-ready projects, but don't support the social infrastructure necessary to get the shovel ready in the first place. If the pipeline of climate forest, forest, climate forward forest management on federal lands and adjacent land ownerships is to expand, there needs to be sustained investments in this front-end collaborative work. Additionally, federal land agencies own social infrastructure and human resources have been decimated by decades of divestment. The proposed outdoor restoration and partnership act would provide needed funds to strengthen the social infrastructure needed to make Western forests more resilient to and help mitigate climate change. Again, I want to thank the committee for inviting me this morning to present at this hearing and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you to all of our witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, let me now start with uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, I'm really glad that your testimony highlighted the tremendous opportunity of using mass timber in commercial buildings. And um, as you know, we had a bipartisan bill, Senator Crapo and I, that we put into the 2018 Farm Bill, and we're seeing a lot of very positive things happening. I, you were talking in your testimony, though, about building on the Timber Innovation Act, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about what you would like to see us do to build on that and really um, the promise of this technology going forward. Thank you. The, I, I think that the, the industry, the mass timber industry, has greatly benefited um, from the progress um, and the recognition that the act provided. Um, specifically, um, architects, designers, and most importantly, probably building codes have been uh, addressed to allow for mass timber construction. And that was probably the largest mover um, and impact the current um, building that's going on right now. Um, I believe there's over a thousand projects in every state that are using mass timber. Um, we feel like that can double easily over the next few years. And so continued research, design improvements, and just knowledge of getting the, the concept of mass timber out, I think is, is very important um, to the continued success of, of, of people recognizing all the benefits that come from it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Dillard, um, I'm really glad to know Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Network is so engaged in this important discussion. And I'm particularly glad to have your support for the Rural Forest Markets Act and the Replant Act. But could you talk more about some of the challenges and barriers that small acreage and minority forest landowners face in entering new markets like the forest carbon market and and managing their forest land in general? I'd be happy to, thank you for the question. Um, the primary, one of the, one of the barriers is, is the markets, carbon markets are complex. Uh, so, you know, sitting with small family forest owners and explaining to them uh, the complexities of carbon markets require education and, and outreach and uh, discussion. Um, so that is one one barrier. The second barrier are the upfront costs. Um, you know, hiring from hiring a forester to mapping out 
uh, the activity to paying uh, to implement the forest management uh, plan associated with carbon markets or to support carbon markets is, I'd say, a second second major barrier. The third is while my family thankfully was able to resolve air property issues and and building trust, we build trust with uh, USDA. That's not that's not true for many underserved uh, landowners. So that that is typically. Uh, another another key key barrier. That's why legislation like the Rules Forest Markets Act is so important. It helps unlock you know the private equity to to help with upfront costs, so my family and families like mine can can afford to uh, participate in carbon markets. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, look forward to working with you on all these issues. Uh, Mr. Fox, uh, I appreciate, again, your, your support and your testimony for our Bipartisan Replan Act. Uh, could you talk more about why clearing the reforestation backlog in our national forest lands is so critical right now? I know you spoke about it, but you know, what, what types of opportunities do you see for state foresters to engage and help with that effort as well? Well, with the Good Neighbor Authority and, and uh, other authorities, uh, we can help our National Forest partners replant those places that have been denuded by catastrophic wildfire and, and other reasons. Uh, we also have state tree nurseries, seedling nurseries, we have one here in Arkansas, and we're gonna need a lot of help uh, expanding those nurseries to meet a demand for billions of trees, not not millions, but billions of trees. And that back, backlog is going to require uh, state forestry nurseries, U.S. Forest Service nurseries to produce the trees to plant. So there are a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of good collaborations uh, with others uh, helping with, with growing the trees, with planting the trees. Uh, there's a, to have the the uh, immigration uh, to allow us to, to have the workers that we need the, uh, to be, <laughs> I've forgotten the, the designation of the, of the uh, immigration uh, place. But in any case, we need those workers to plant the trees as well. So those things, the trees, the workers to plan them and cooperation with the Forest Service and others are the, are the ingredients to be successful. Thank you so much. Senator Bozeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Rago, uh, Winrock's American Carbon Registry was founded in 1996 as the first private voluntary gas registry in the world. And you and yourself have over 20 years of experience in this space. Suffice it to say, you and Winrock are not new to the carbon and related markets in the forest sec sector. Would you share, share your recommendations on what you think is needed or perhaps not needed from the federal government in this voluntary market space as it relates to forestry? Thank you, Senator. I'm happy to answer the question. Um, so as I mentioned, there is unprecedented demand for offsets and to really scale up the volume of offsets coming from US forests, a lot of work has to be done and a lot of capital is needed. So I think there is an important role for the, government, the federal government to play to support the growth and scaling of the forest carbon market. And that could be by providing capacity building support or through loans as referenced in the Royal, Rural Forest Market Act. Um, those loans could go to companies and organizations who are aggregating and providing services to landowners or to, to directly to landowners um, or potentially for expanding nursery production as I understand that that is a barrier to expanding reforestation efforts in the United States. However, I do wanna reiterate, and as I stated in my testimony, um, there is no need to reinvent the wheel here. The carbon market is operating already and it is growing rapidly. And so we recommend that any role that the government plays will um, work to complement the carbon market and the existing frameworks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all know, Mr. Fox, we all know that uh, wildfires can be enormous carbon emission events in addition to wildfire pests and diseases that can dev devastate healthy forests and make the timber from those forests unmarketable. Active forest management, including prescribed fire and mechanical treatments, is critical to decreasing the frequency and scope of these events and protecting the overall health 
of our forest. Mr. Fox, in addition to mitigating wildfire and protecting against pests and diseases, what role do you perceive active management having as it relates to carbon sequestration in the growing wood products industry, including mass timber? Well, as you know, Senator, I like to say uh, healthy forests need healthy markets. Healthy forests beget clean water, clean air, carbon sequestration, wildlife habitat, and all those things. That's, that's being redundant, actually. Forests are both and, not either or. So while we harvest and thin our forest, that helps the remaining trees to grow, gives light to the ground, lets those plants uh, come up, express themselves that the uh, uh, turkeys like and, and hunters like turkeys and the insects like. All those things in our ecological system do better when the trees are thin. But also the young trees, whether they're plantation trees or whether they're naturally regenerated, store more carbon than older trees. So all trees have a life cycle. They get old just like people do. And, and uh, the older the tree, the less carbon it's storing. So we need those variations, diversity of age classes. We need diversity of structure in the forest for all those things. But young, vigorous, healthy forests store more carbon than any other kind of forest. Thank you very much. Ms. Dillard, um, you mentioned the heirs property, which again is something that I'm very interested in. Tell me though, what would it, would it be helpful in, as you get that together and this and that, uh, would it be helpful if you doubled the capital gains tax? Uh, in regard to that. Also, if you wanted to retire and uh, sell your property to your son or maybe a partner, uh, is that a helpful thing to uh, our foresters, people in your situation, your, your fellow foresters, your neighbors, going from 23% to 43%? Senator, I would I would love to give you an answer if I may give uh, work on an answer uh, for you and and circle back if that's okay. No, I appreciate that. But uh, again, uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Fox the same question. Got to unmute. Uh, go. Senator, if you could, could uh, guide me through the question one what, more what, time. How is it going to help the forest industry if we raise capital gains from 23% to 43%? What effect would that have on forestry? And then also the stepped up basis in the sense of, uh, uh, again, uh, what that would do with transfer of property. Well, any raise in the capital gains tax is going to go hard against family forest landowners. And uh, it's going to make it harder uh, generationally. So either either timber will not be cut in, in order not to, to uh, uh, have the tax applied, or it's going to be cut really quickly and uh, before the, the tax is raised. But, but the uh, a raise in the capital gains tax uh, without a stepped up basis uh, is frankly devastating to family forest landowners. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just for the knowledge of the member, Senator Bennett is next, and then Senator Fisher and Senator Smith is the order that I have at the moment. Senator Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Cheng, la last December, a group of forest policy experts sent our committee a letter outlining the forest management and wildfire challenges in the West. They noted that higher temperatures, more severe drought and longer fire seasons, all driven by climate change, pose a threat to community safety, public health, and our watersheds. I think you described these as compounding disturbances in your testimony. The group suggests investing 40 to $60 billion over the next decade to accelerate action and make our forests more resilient. In April, I introduced a bill with Senator Wyden, the Outdoor 
Restoration Partnership Act that provides a framework to make this type of investment in forest health. If we can target resources to high priority areas and partner with states, tribes, municipalities, and landowners, we could build climate resilience and create millions of jobs in the process. Dr. Chen, given your experience at the local level and working across boundaries, what should this committee keep in mind when considering a major investment in forest restoration? For example, what infrastructure exists to support forest restoration and wildfire mitigation in the West? What are some of the gaps and what are some of the likely challenges? Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, thank you for that question. The, I'll first preface my, my comments saying that, the, the, that this is a, the, the cost of these fires in particular, but also just the loss of forests as a result of variety of mortality events is, are, th these are building billion dollar problems and, and where, how we've addressed them, at least in the West and federal forest lands is, is, is almost like nickel, nickel and diming it. Um, and we, we've really lacked the, uh, that upfront investment for that front end uh, collaborative work to really build the social capacity, uh, the social acceptance, uh, the science basis for uh, where we need to do that work at the scale we need to do it. And so a lot of that, I, I, would, I would definitely want to see that investment uh, provided to especially local community-based organizations that are really at the forefront of uh, convening and coordinating a lot of the, the multi-stakeholder multi collaboratives that we are seeing. Uh, they are really operating on a shoestring, but they are really bearing the brunt uh, of uh, this issue and trying to create that pipeline to work at the scale. The second is uh, that we are, we are not only facing a backlog of reforestation, but also facing a backlog in terms of prescribed fire as a important tool to really mitigate those large catastrophic fires. And as my colleague, uh, Dr. Courtney Schultz at Colorado State University has uh, provided uh, research as well as testimony to Congress is that one of the biggest gaps and biggest bottlenecks for scaling up the prescribed fire programs that we really need is simply a lack of, of horsepower, the lack of human resources and the, the people with the training and qualifications uh, and basically a, a, a prescribed fire workforce. And I think that would, uh, that would be able to complement a lot of the other workforces uh, that we also need to stand up, the tree planting workforce uh, that State Forester Fox had mentioned. Uh, the, the last point is that we, especially here in the Intermountain West, uh, where we really uh, don't have very great uh, forest products markets, uh, the kind of industry and operations that we have uh, might, might not necessarily be at the scale of the work or uh, be able to accommodate the kind of materials that can uh, be provide that economic um, incentive back to forest land management. Um, so really standing up the kinds of infrastructure and the kind of operations that need to work at the scale in the places that need to occur um, can also need a, a, a good lift. We, we have uh, sawmills that are kind of scattered. They're not, they're few and far between and the, the distances uh, for um, hauling material is, is a huge barrier. And so to be able to have better distributed um, uh, forest uh, wood utilization uh, uh, industries and operators uh, would be a great benefit. That, thank you, Dr. Cheng. I want to just leave my colleagues with this thought, because as I said, Secretary Vilsack was out. $60 billion sounds like a lot of money, and I, I, I know that it does. We're spending that money anyway. We're just spending it fighting fires. It costs us for every single acre, and the, the, we heard this the other day out there from the Forest Service, every acre that we treat costs $1,500 to treat. Every acre that we deal with in a forest fire costs us $50,000. So we are profoundly wasting the American people's money, and, and we're not, and, and by doing it, we're not creating any of the do jobs that Dr. Cheng just talked about. We could create a bunch of jobs on the front end that would be sustaining and, and useful to the economy, I think. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I could not agree with you more. I mean, those numbers, just the numbers alone, 
say it. And that doesn't count the devastation or what's happening to people in terms of the forest fires and, and Not so to on. mention what both of you guys talked about, which is the lack of sequestration of carbon. I mean, the, this is right. all of that CO2 is going up into the atmosphere. Right, right. So. So. Well, this is why we're doing the hearing. This is why we are glad you are chair of the subcommittee and uh, look forward to working with you on this. So, uh, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fox, I wanted to ask you about a project in Nebraska that has huge p potential forestry and the agriculture sector in addressing climate change. The Nebraska Forest Service and industry partners have started the Great Plains Biochar Initiative, which helps improve awareness and market development of biochar in the Great Plains. The Nebraska Forest Service conducted a pilot study to examine potential benefits of providing biochar as a feed supplement to cattle to reduce methane emissions and increased animal productivity. Can you talk about the results of that pilot and the potential climate benefits? I can, Sandy, for the question. Um, although I'm a tree guy, I'm not a cattle guy, uh, but isn't it interesting that our forests can, can help uh, agricultural productivity, uh, whether, whether it's biochar blended into the ground as a soil amendment for row crop farmers, or whether biochar is blended into the feed of cattle. That's, that's the pilot project in Nebraska. Biochar was blended into the feed for cattle. Methane production decreased by over 10%. Uh, growth of the cattle increased, or production of the cattle increased by almost 10%. And it's, it's really pretty cool. I, you know, I hadn't thought about this myself, but uh, in Nebraska or whether you're, whether you're uh, cattle raising in Arkansas, uh, it's a good thing for a, a forest product, and it's a new forest product. There are many other forest products, but uh, this one's really an innovative example of how we can use our trees. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. And also, how important are locally made conservation goals and plans in managing privately owned forests? And how best could the federal government help private forest owners manage their forest without imposing or requiring uh, federal conservation requirements and standards. Well, thank you, Senator. Again, uh, I was on the Jefferson County Conservation District about 20 years ago. I was a token forester on another farmer board, and I appreciated being, being there. And uh, I'm, I'm very aware of the, uh, where NASF partners with the National Association of Conservation Districts. The local level, at the local level, conservation districts is where conservation planning can go. And uh, in Arkansas, we have our State Forest Action Plan mandated by the 2008 Farm Bill and re-upped re after 10 years. All states do that. And we use stakeholders like the Arkansas Association of Conservation Districts a lot of other stakeholders to plan what we're gonna do. But then at that local level, conservation districts help NRCS uh, direct equip funds, environmental quality incentive program funds toward the farmers. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road is, is where those producers use the monies. And if Arkansas is 57% uh, forested, so we've got 75 counties, each county has a conservation district, those counties choose different things to apply the equip funds. Their priorities are different depending on what's going on in their county. It's the best way. We're a voluntary state we, here in Arkansas, and it's the best voluntary way to have private landowners uh, do conservation work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harris, I... Um... I understand you are a board member of the National Alliance of Forest Owners, so um, private forest uh, forest owners. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I would ask you that same question, how the federal government can help uh, private forest owners manage their forests without a lot of requirements or, or um, imposing a lot of regulations. And then I also noticed um, when, when um, 
we heard about the stepped up basis and uh, the issue there. You were nodding your head. Uh, so would you like to also comment on that? Um, I, I guess I'll start off with, you know, as, as you know, a forester and, 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 a, and a proud one, we, you know, what we're hoping to highlight today is that, that our organizations and, and our companies do a lot of good. And I think that you have to think of our nation's forest is a mosaic. Um, one size does not fit all. And so um, I think that on the private working forest level, the, the markets speak loudly to what um, benefits us and, and how we like to manage our forests and what ultimately we're, we're, we're working towards. Um, so, you know, conservation focus is, is, is interesting because as Mr. Fox said, when we know what is important in specific areas, and I think that's important is that, you know, at a big holistic macro level is one thing but when we can drive down to area, specific areas or specific focus, I think there's a lot of opportunities to do a lot of good. Um, I can use an example in the state of Georgia um, where uh, groups like the Nature Conservancy have, have targeted and, and are looking to protect gopher tortoise habitat. Well, companies like mine and the other ones that I work with, if we understand what the ob objectives are, we can work towards, because we have this mosaic of forests, we can work towards managing um, where we're not only growing our trees um, and, and doing that well, but also helping with conservation. Um, so I think that on the private working level, it's, 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 it's very specific as you go down to each individual area. As far as taxes, um, I think that, that the one thing that concerns me with that, and I was, I was shaking my head, is that um, I think that a lot of forest landowners, especially um, family landowners, um, are what we what we probably like to say they're they're land rich and cash poor, and tax policies that raise those rates um, on on landowners force them to make bad decisions if they have to pay a tax bill um, because of tax legislation, and so I I would be concerned about. Um, tax changes that that raise those rates. The landowners don't have the cash to pay for them. And what we see in our industry is that forces families to either sell land or sell timber that they don't want to in order to pay those tax bills. And I, that's why I was, was nodding my head. Yes, I, I do think it's a very important consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Senator Smith, and then we'll have Senator Tuberville. Senator well, Smith. thank you so much. Uh, Chair Savanow, and Ranking Member Bozeman for pulling this committee together. I know that the uh, 30,000 people in Minnesota that uh, work in the uh, forest products um, sector in, um, in our state um, are so happy to see a hearing on forestry in the um, Ag Committee. And you know, I also know from them that this past year with COVID has been um, a challenging year in so many different ways. And like just like so many other industries around the country, um, timber harvesting and hauling has had a difficult year and it has been um, a real challenge. I want to just note that I'm grateful that I had a chance to work with um, Senator Collins on my Loggers Relief Act, which I introduced last year. We got um, included in the year end package and this bill is providing a funding for direct assistance to loggers and log haulers impacted by the pandemic. So an important part of the forest products sector. But I'd like to spend my time today with all of you. Welcome to the panel. It's great to be with you. I'm talking about uh, this um, concept of carbon sinks and um, carbon markets. You know, I think a lot of times when we talk about getting to a net zero economy, we don't spend enough time talking about the net part of that. Um, you know, when we are adding carbon into the atmosphere, we also at the same time can be capturing and storing carbon from the atmosphere. And our forests are a giant reservoir of captured carbon and need to be a crucial part of our strategy for addressing climate change in and doing that in ways that are creating jobs and opportunity for Americans. So um, that's what we need to do, right? We need to dramatically reduce carbon in our atmosphere in a way that creates jobs and works for forest owners and operators. And I think this has to be part of our strategy. So this brings me to the question of carbon markets. Um, voluntary carbon markets 
seem to be, could be um, a huge opportunity for forest landowners and help to contribute to our overall goals and strategy, create, creating also ways for them to um, earn revenue. But I have heard from um, uh, folks in Minnesota that the private carbon offset market is a little bit of um, the Wild West when it comes to how it works. And um, it's got a lot of momentum, but not a lot of guardrails that are actually protecting uh, landowners. So I, I'm really interested in diving into this a bit. And I'd like to uh, start with um, Ms. Orego and hope I'm saying your name correctly and Dr. Chang. Um, how can we, how do you see this? How can we ensure the integrity of forest carbon stocks and support the participation in carbon markets in a ways that, um, that is actually good for uh, landowners? Thank you, Thank Senator. You. I'm happy to start. Um, so we, you know, we always welcome scrutiny. Um, as I said in my testimony, growth um, and long-term sustainability of the carbon market does depend on integrity. So we are always taking on board any criticisms and innovating and improving our processes and our requirements based on the latest science and technology to ensure that those emission reductions are real, credible, and verifiable. Um, unfortunately, some of the critics and the critical coverage has limited sites on few, a few cherry-picked examples. Um, rather than examining the broader impact of the forest carbon market, which is a hugely positive story that we're trying to um, get out there and tell um, that story a little bit better. But um, you know, we, we really feel like there are guardrails. We see a lot of momentum. It's, uh, it's picking up quickly, and we're happy to work with um, the Forest Centers of Minnesota to, to tackle some of their concerns. Thank you. Dr. Chang? Thank you for the question, Senator Smith. And this is a little bit outside my expertise, so I would have to defer to uh, experts like Ms. Arego, but I think one of the challenges that we have out here in the West is, um, at least in my state, in Colorado and in other states, um, our, our forests are, are net, are, are losing carbon faster than they're sequestering. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's lots of opportunities to look at ways in which carbon markets can be brought back as a as an investment tool, as an economic incentive. I think that again, I think the the ways in which we can calculate uh, sequestration versus loss is something that I know is very controversial. Um, and I think that a, a lot more uh, maybe investment in, into the science of how we actually monitor and capture that is also needed. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think that there's a lot of power and a huge amount of potential on this, and I look forward to um, working on this with Minnesota forest product owners and, and, and uh, folks all over the country, because I think it's an important part of our strategy. Thank you very much, Chair Sabanow. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Tuberville and then Senator Warnock will be next. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for having this today. Uh, you know, Alabama has 23.1 million acres of forest. 71 percent uh, of our state is in forestry. 94 percent of those forests are owned by more than 250,000 private forest owners, including me. Uh, as of 2019, Alabama has the largest inventory of standing timber ever recorded, 42.2 billion cubic feet. Since 2001, we have seen 37.3% increase in volume of standing timber. Ecosystem carbon in Alabama's forest carbon in soil above and below ground biomass deadwood and litter has increased from 1 billion metric tons in 1990 to 1.4 billion metric tons in 2019. Alabama's forest removed 41% of all CO2 emissions in the state, and Alabama's forests currently store 47 years of all CO2 emissions produced in the state. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, Mr. Harris, forest landowners are capable of growing more timber in their forest. We have the tools and technologies to increase the amount of timber growing in our forest if there is a market for the products being produced. Uh, uh, to a good Auburn man, War Eagle, uh, what suggestions do you have to encourage stronger markets and provide voluntary incentives to landowners to implement forest management policies? War Eagle, Senator. Um, I think, it, you know, Alabama is a great story and, uh, we, we, Alabama does a great job. We own 22,000 acres in the state. Um, and I think that the forest industry is strong, alive and healthy. Um, what we are doing right now is, is growing a lot of timber, um, more timber than we use. And so the, the, the main thing that we can do 
within the entire nation really is to create healthy markets um, and, and invigorate them, support them, uh, and, and that will benefit forest landowners. I think the biggest one that we see and the biggest opportunity currently right now, which is a win-win for this committee in particular, is mass timber. Um, using more wood um, that becomes permanently sequestered in a building that, that people occupy um, and enjoy um, is something very unique and special about our business. And so a new market created for timber um, that consumes more wood um, will definitely benefit landowners um, in the end. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fox, in your testimony, you discussed the advancement of cross-laminated. Uh, and down in Dothan, Alabama, there is a smart lamb facility in, that produces mass timber products. From your ample experience uh, in the forestry sector, can you explain how building with wood, like mass wood timber, uh, offer a solution not only for the carbon sequestered in the long-lived wood product, but also, how mass timber products offer management opportunities, especially for small diameter trees? Surely, Senator, thank you for the question. I, I, I'm remiss if I don't point out that some of the best people in Alabama were born in Arkansas. <laughs> having, having said such, uh, CLT, cross laminated timber, is a terrific product. Uh, it cuts down labor costs like by two thirds. Uh, when you're putting up a building like the dorm at the University of Arkansas. Structure Lamb's also completing, in fact, they're doing some uh, soft opening dry runs on a, on a cross-laminated timber plant in Conway, Arkansas, just north of Little Rock, to supply uh, the 350-acre Walmart uh, campus that's to be built in, in Bentonville uh, very soon. So we're excited about that. That's jobs. Uh, any place that a lumber mill, a sawmill has to has to the ability to sell their products is good for the land for forest landowners. So uh, we're, as I've already stated, we're we're overproducing. We're we're growing 20 million tons more in my state than are being harvested, and the harvest is at record levels. So we've learned how to grow. Now we're going to have to learn how to balance the growth to the to the uh, markets, and and without that balance, sooner or later there's too many trees. It's too dense. The bugs come, or wildfire comes, and we have we have um, catastrophic events. So uh, anything we can do, and right now those two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights are used in cross laminated timber, small diameter timber. Uh, does not have a home. There are less paper mills in my state, and I think in your state, and a lot. There's 15 less paper mills than there were about 20 years ago in Arkansas. So they use the small diameter timber. We need pellets in that market that that uses small diameter timber, but we're overcrowding with those uh, six inch diameter and eight inch diameter trees that don't quite make it to saw logs. We need to be able to thin those too. So. Whichever size, whatever species, it's always good to have a market because conservation without cash is just conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Warnock, welcome. Thank you so very much. Um, good to follow my colleague from Alabama. If you're not born in Georgia, I guess Alabama will do. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman uh, Stabenow, for holding this hearing uh, on a topic that's important to all of us. I'm proud to say that Georgia is the number one forestry state in the nation, uh, providing direct and downstream jobs to over 141,000 Georgians uh, and others across the nation. Uh, Georgia is home to over 22 million acres a privately owned forestry land, forest land, generating an annual economic impact of $36.5 billion. This industry is an economic driver for the rural communities throughout Georgia. Georgia, on the other hand, is also a state of incredible growth. Our population is currently over 10.7 million people, representing an 11% population increase 
uh, in the past, in the last decade. And much of this change is driven by growth uh, in and around uh, the metro Atlanta area. Sometimes in my travels and in politics, I hear folks talking about the rural urban divide in Georgia. But I think that there are plenty of opportunities to increase economic connections between Atlanta, metro Atlanta, and the rural parts of our state, and to do so in a way that centers climate smart growth that creates jobs and opportunities uh, while being kind to our planet. Mr. Harris, you have a long history of working on forestry issues in Georgia. How can population growth in a city like Atlanta actually provide economic opportunities for rural communities in Georgia who rely on timber production? Thank you, Senator. I think that the most exciting at Jamestown, I think one of the most exciting things that, that we've seen is this this mass timber um, awakening, if you will. And we're very excited about the opportunity to tie our commercial real estate business together with our timberland business. It just makes sense. Um, mass timber, obviously, if used more in construction, um, would help a lot of things that we're talking about today. But right now, the industry is, 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 is emerging. And so if we wanted to build mass timber buildings in Atlanta, Savannah, uh, Brunswick, uh, we would probably have to source that timber and that timber production from out of state in the case of Georgia. And I think that's the case for many states. We do not have a lot of mass timber manufacturing plants. We have a lot of sawmills, but we don't have the plants to put together the mass timber panels. So if we believe that using wood is, 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 is good and it's a great solution for um, urban housing um, and construction and commercial spaces as well, and that starts to take hold, that will likely lay, lead to manufacturing plants that are more local. And I think that benefits all states really um, because it could really be put up anywhere, but in particular, I think that that urban rural interface between building and more urban environment um, and the use of, of mass timber and wood um, would benefit uh, Atlantans in particular greatly. Mm -hmm. So, so the growth in Atlanta is accompanied by an emphasis on sustainable development and green materials. I think that's something all of us have to be concerned about. Is Georgia's forestry sector prepared to meet the increasing demand for climate smart products? Um, and and if not, how, how can Congress be helpful? I think Georgia is absolutely prepared and ready to take this challenge on. Um, we, I, I, as a Georgian and just a, in, in a forester just in general, I think all states are, are prepared to take on this challenge. We do amazing things with our forests, um, which is, you know, basically providing 90% of what the U.S. needs as far as wood products and forest products that people use every day. We do that very well, um, and we're extremely well positioned to, to, to leverage off of that um, to, to building a green economy. Um, I think we're right in the forefront of that. And so states that, that are heavily forested, um, like Georgia, um, are, are ready, willing, and able to contribute to positive environmental impacts. Um, and we're, we're quite proud of that. And we honestly would love to talk more about that and share um, more about that. And I think Congress can help with that, with research and study. Um, I think that's the one thing that, that that's lacking right now. So things like um, the FIA, the, the Forest Inventory um, Act that where we're measuring. are growing sustainably would be a big a big thing for us and Congress could do. So I think um, investments into into research and study and adding credibility to our our sector would would greatly benefit. Great. Well well thank you so much, Mr. Harris, and I appreciate uh, your work uh, in Georgia's forestry sector. Uh, this challenge around climate change it's a challenge, but it also creates economic opportunities for our forestry sector. We make smart investments, and I think it helps to uh, helps Georgians both in the rural, uh, rural Georgia, and in our urban centers. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Senator.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Warnock. Senator Thune. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and Ranking Member Bozeman, uh, for having today's hearing. And I want to thank our uh, panelists uh, as well before the committee for your input on this issue. Mr. Fox, the Black Hills National Forest is a critical component of South Dakota's economy that supports recreation, agriculture, and resource development. The forest also helps support the local timber industry and supply lumber, which is the, in high demand right now, I think, as we all know. Unfortunately, a sawmill in Hill City, South Dakota is closing due to lack of available timber. The sawmill closure follows cuts in recent years to the Black Hills National Forest Timber Sale Program, which the mill relies on for its supply. The mill closure will not only result in the loss of more than 100 jobs, which is a huge impact on that small community, it would also have lasting effects on the uh, community and the regional economy. Um, I'm a longtime supporter of proactive forest management to help mitigate the risk of wildfires, maintain healthy forests, and support rural economies. Uh, Mr. Fox, could you talk about the importance of forest management and the benefits that it provides? Uh, and are there ways that Congress can make forest management more effective? Thank you, Senator Thune. Uh, I'd love to talk about that. You know, if, if, uh, all forests have a growth rate. It might be, if it's a very young forest, it, it can be well above 10%. If it's an older forest, it, it goes down. So an older forest in Arkansas uh, that's not growing too well might be 6%, might be uh, even 2%. So when you, when you don't harvest, when you just let the trees grow and get older and slower and susceptible to disease, uh, and wildfire, they're going to slow down. So one way to keep the forest growing faster and more vibrant is to harvest uh, timber in, whether it's public land or private land. Doesn't doesn't matter who owns the land. The the forest, the silviculture works the same way. So so we need those forest markets, and we need to be open to the forest markets. Uh, let's let's say the the Black Hills in order to, to get the growth, the young, vibrant growth that any forest needs, whether it's ponderosa pine or, or whether it's southern yellow loblolly pine or whether it's cherry bark oak or, or post oak, they all need room to grow and we need, we need a good uh, balance of, of those younger trees. So that's part of the forest management story. We must manage to keep our forest resilient and to keep them resilient, they need young stocking coming on. And all the stands don't have to be the same age or the same stocking. We can have a lot of, of variability between stands within one forest. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thank you. And I just couldn't agree more. And I just think that that's, uh, uh, those management practices that maintain a healthy forest are so essential. And uh, especially true right now in the Black Hills, where as I mentioned, um, there have been consistent uh, cutbacks or attempts to cut back the forest uh, harvest and to get away from management, which in the end creates a, a more, much healthier forest. And so I hope the Forest Service here in Washington, D.C. is listening um, to the needs that many of our forests have around the country. I don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to recognize this hearing rightfully recognizes the role that forests serve in carbon sinks. And I hope one of the takeaways today is the importance of forest management timber harvest, and replanting to maintain healthy, resilient forests, especially given the higher rate of carbon capture of younger trees. Uh, in order to leverage these natural carbon sinks, however, we need to ensure that we are actually able to replant trees after a disturbance, such as a wildfire or a hurricane. And according to the Forest Resources Association, there's a roughly three to five year backlog in forest fire remediation, which has gone unaddressed because of a shortage of workers, including H2B visa workers. So could any of you um, quickly, I don't have a lot of time, but speak to the uh, labor challenges that we're facing out there to help restore our forests? I'll be happy to try that. H2B visas are uh, vital to our planting crews and our the companies that, that plant behind uh, either harvesting jobs or wildfire. And without enough workers and their 
it's, it's very strained right now to find enough workers seasonally to do the planting. You don't want to plant in the hot time of the year. You got to plant in the cool dormant season of the year. And that again, doesn't really matter which part of the country you're in. And uh, so those visas are imperative to uh, the workers that we need to replenish our forests. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Thune. Uh, we have now Senator Brown, then Senator Braun, and Senator Gillibrand. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, much of the testimony today is focused on the carbon storage potential of forests and smaller timber stands, but tree cover in urban settings is also crucial in keeping our cities and towns livable in a warming climate. I, I read four or five years ago a book called Urban Forests that pointed out, if I can remember, fairly precisely the numbers, tree cover in, in Beverly Hills from aerial photographs exceeded 50% of the, of the land. In South Central LA, it was about 12 or 13 or 14%. You can see what that means to all kinds of issues from clean water and soil and air to just livability with temperatures and all that and ox, all, all the things that so could could any of the panelists and anyone that wants to answer this speak to the benefits of tree cover for those living in cities and towns and the and at the same time the particular challenges of growing and maintaining canopy in cities whoever feels most eager to answer that question or address that question well i think thank you senator i think i'm talking too much and i'll be happy for all my right. Colleagues to chime in. Uh, I think all I can say all state forestry agencies have an urban forestry program. And if you believe in climate smart forestry, which applies to rural forestry, it also applies to urban forestry. Those benefits for over uh, are, are huge. They slow down water, they shade buildings and and I think it's like 15% less cost for utilities when buildings are shaded. Uh, they, there's an aesthetic value, a uh, psychological value for, for just having trees in your neighborhood. It's a calmer neighborhood. Uh, shop masters, small, small shops like trees in front of their, in front of their places of business. Uh, shoppers are more inclined to buy when there's trees there. Uh, there, we, we do quite a lot with our nursery business to provide trees for the urban setting. There's even uses for urban trees that die or need to be removed for road widening. Uh, there are all sorts of benefits uh, for healthy urban forests. So a lot of work goes into that and uh, state forestry agencies step up to the plate there. Well, I'm, I'm thank you. I, the, the, um, the, the cruel legacy of racist policies like redlining is all too clear in the location of, of urban heat islands today. You, you suggest that. Studies show that these heat islands are concentrated in neighborhoods with the fewest trees. I'm working on legislation to improve tree canopy in neighborhoods that have been cut off from investment because of these policies. I hope to work with members of this committee to ensure that the worst climate impacts aren't relegated to the most vulnerable communities. That may be planting new trees in cities like Cleveland or maintaining existing canopies. Canopy, it's clear to me that Forest Service can and should play a role in helping communities across the country make these investments. So the second part of that question in the last couple of minutes, um, what are the particular challenges of, of growing and maintaining canopies and canopy in cities, if someone could try to address that for me? And if nobody does, it's back to this. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so here in Arkansas, being able to take those measurements and know what the tree canopy is, so that's what our urban foresters do. They know what their canopy is is what, what that closure rate is, it might be 25%, it might be 60%. And then they can plan how to upgrade the, the tree canopy in their city or a certain neighborhood. But first, 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 you gotta measure and you gotta know what you're working with. So there's quite a bit of that that goes on all through the cities and towns uh, in, in the United States. Uh, there are, it's, it's quite a large industry to be, to be frank about maintaining uh, 
planting and maintaining urban forests. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Dr. Chang, my last question is, can you talk about potential workforce needs as it relates to urban forestry? Dr. Chang. Senator Brown, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that, I think it pairs with a lot of the, the issues that we've been talking about overall in terms of rural forestry and federal land forestry. There's just been, just been an underinvestment in forest and tree planting, tree care, forest management in general. Um, especially in urban areas, this is a, this is a burden that's borne uh, by cities themselves uh, and their tax base. Um, and so it's, it's something that we, we really distribute and segment and silo our uh, capacity for tree and forest management, and that could be better integrated. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Senator Stabenow, Madam Chair, thank you for the really important hearing. Thanks very much. And now to Senator Braun, my partner on so many of these issues. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Whenever we have a discussion on forestry, it uh, is my favorite subject. Uh, in fact, I've been a practicing tree farmer for uh, since the late 80s. Uh, neat thing about that is it's kind of a great therapy for this new job I have as a U.S. Senator. So I go back every weekend. I want to emphasize a couple points uh, that I've noticed, especially over the last few years, but uh, many others have echoed here, how a growing, well-managed forest does sequester more carbon. And that means that you need to manage your woodland not only from periodic harvests to make sure that you're culling out what may not be that species uh, of desired growth, the ones that need to come out to generate more room for other trees, and then intermittent work called timber stand improvement. Um, there's been a lot of interest too. I'm uh, a member of most of the forest associations across the country and within my state in climate and how forests become a more important part of that. And what I know most about forest ground, especially so much of it owned by farmers, they're great stewards of their cropland. Many times the management in their woodland due to the periodic uh, income different from their annual rotation uh, doesn't get the attention it needs. So it means there's a lot of upside potential. But what, I, what I wanna focus on here today and my question would be for uh, Mr. Harris and Mr. Fox, and if there's uh, time for anyone else, where I spend the most time on the weekends, over the last five years especially, 10 years when it started showing up on the radar, emerald ash borer, which came from China probably on pallets, has taken out nearly every ash tree in this country, comprised 8% of all hardwoods, that's devastating on whatever management you had in place and probably your ability to sequester carbon. Japanese stiltgrass, the biggest problem we have in southern Indiana, suffocates regeneration. You got bush honeysuckle, garlic mustard, multifloral rose, alanthus, tree of heaven, many others I could mention. Many came in through nurseries. I'd love to know what your opinion is of where invasive species, uh, whether it's a bug or a, another bush or tree, where does that weigh in on the health of our forests? And are you having as many issues in your backyard as I am in mine in what I see across Indiana? Senator, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay, Mr. Fox. Um, as, as you know, we own and manage about 6,500 acres in your state. Um, all of the things that you just discussed are very real and very real to us. Um, I think invasive species um, are a, a, a huge problem that the government, the federal government and state governments can help us with. Um, it's the expertise needed to understand what we're dealing with, how to deal with it, and how to deal with it cost effectively is a major thing that a lot of landowners struggle with. And I think it, especially smaller private landowners struggle with, with it even more. You know, our, our company is large. My full-time job is being our, our company's forester. And so I, I'm paid and, and required to keep up with all of these things and be proactive. Proactive management is a huge part of invasive species and knowing what we're dealing with and how to deal with them. 
But I would say that, that the small landowners are the ones who suffer the most from that because they may not even know that they have the problems until it's too late. Um, but they, they are very real um, and, and things that we have to deal with every day. Senator, uh, again, thank you for the question. Uh, this is where you and the committee can really help us. Our, our forest health work is somewhat limited budget-wise. And we get major help from the U.S. Forest Service in their forest health program, whether it's an urban forest or whether it's a rural forest. We conduct uh, detection flights when we think we have an Ips beetle outbreak, uh, which happened a little bit in West Arkansas a couple of years ago. Or, or it might be red oak borer, which wiped out a million acres in Arkansas and Missouri of red oaks, a native insect that attacks uh, plant of red oak trees when there's too many trees per acre and when there's after a drought. But that forest health network that's within the Forest Service helps us have the, the uh, funds to look and see so that we can serve landowners like Ms. Dillard and, and uh, warn them, help them with corrections uh, or mitigation when they might have a uh, southern pine beetle or emerald ash borer. We have it here in Arkansas. Our ash is not quite gone yet, but it's leaving. And uh, we need those federal program dollars for forest health uh, to know uh, how we can help to educate landowners. Uh, and we need it in forest uh, inventory and analysis. So when we take plots, and we can see what's out there and know we have a problem discover the problem. So you can really help us. Thank you, sir. You bet. And the sad thing about invasive species is that most uh, forest owners don't know they have invasive species in their woods because until you really get into the details of managing your own woodland, uh, it looks like the landscape. And I believe it's probably the most serious threat we have on managing our woodlands. I think it'd be an interesting discussion for a further committee hearing sometime. Well, thank you, Senator Braun. And I can just say from Michigan, we've lost tens of millions of trees because of emerald ash borer alone. I mean, it's just been devastating. So that's uh, an important discussion. Thank you. Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Dr. Cheng, thank you, for, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Um, global deforestation impacts our security, climate change, wildfires, local indigenous communities, and the global health crisis we are facing from COVID-19. Zoonotic spillover, the transmission of novel pathogens from animals to human, is the origin of most emerging infectious diseases, including COVID-19. The rate of zoonotic disease outbreaks is rapidly increasing and driven by human activities that increase interactions between wildlife, livestock, and people. Land use change, particularly the clearing, degradation, and fragmentation of tropical forests within emerging disease hotspots, as well as wild, the wildlife trade and intensive livestock production are of the greatest concern from a One Health and pandemic prevention perspective. Dr. Chang, what sort of activities does Congress need to be looking at in order to stop global deforestation and to prevent future pandemics from occurring? And what One Health approaches to this issue of deforestation do you find helpful? Senator Gillibrand, thank you for the question. The, the, there has been international agreements uh, around, especially forest uh, retention and deforestation. Um, a lot of those uh, re require um, just a lot of voluntary practices on the part of, <clears throat> excuse me, national governments. And so we end up relying a lot on uh, non-governmental organizations to help provide incentives uh, for uh, uh, especially uh, countries that uh, to maintain those uh, forest covers. Um, there's also a forest products trade that is, uh, that can either help um, facilitate or frustrate these global deforestation issues. And so working with countries and a producing our own timber 
using our own timber resources for domestic consumption is, is a great opportunity for us to be able to solve that problem. Uh, the, the U.S. imports uh, enormous, uh, way more timber for our uh, domestic consumption than we produce ourselves. And so doing our part <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, cons consuming what we, uh, producing what we consume is a way for us to be able to contribute to uh, deforestation problems. Thank you. Um, New York State, I want to follow along the conversation that Senator Braun uh, really delved into. Um, and the problems you're facing, Senator Braun, are the same, same ones we're facing in New York. Uh, New York State has more invasive forest insects and diseases than any other state. These insects and diseases arrive in our country as an unintended byproduct of global trade. The two main pathways of entry are on live trees and shrubs imported for, for the nursery trade and in solid wood packing materials such as crates and pallets. In addition to severe ecological damage, these pests cause billions of dollars per year nationwide in economic damages, costs which fall largely on homeowners and local governments. Pests like the spotted lanternfly, which arrived on a stone pallet from Asia, posed a severe risk to crops and forests all around the US. This pest can weaken trees, cause the loss of leaves, and make leaves more susceptible to other pests and diseases. Mr. Fox, should there be more coordination between the Forest Service and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to combat invasive species, such as the spotted lanternfly? Lantern well, thank you, Senator. Uh, there's, there's a an obvious answer. There's really good um, cooperation between APHIS and U.S. Forest Service within the U.S. Department of Agriculture right now. Uh, just here in the Arkansas Department of Agriculture, we cooperate with our plant board. Uh, so forestry division and, and plant industry division uh, 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 epidemiologists work together with APHIS on, on these issues here in my state. Um, having said that, uh, more is, is, is better here. Those, those pests are spreading. We have a Kogan grass problem here in the South that we've got to work on. And, uh, we've got fire ants here in the South that have been with us now for 30, 40 years. So there are constant things that we have to, to work on, uh, that more cooperation would definitely help. And, and knowing that in that cooperation is the cooperation of state agencies like Plant Industries Division here and those similar ones in other states. So you need, you need cooperation at the state level as well as the federal level. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thanks very much. Well, let me thank all of our witnesses again. This has really been an excellent hearing. And uh, thank you, Senator Bozeman, for working with with me on this. We've heard very clearly that as family foresters and professionals and public servants working in the field every day, you're seeing what we're seeing, a real opportunity for public and private forest land to lead the way in addressing the climate crisis. We've also heard that if we want to be broadly successful in this effort, we have to make sure policies work for everyone. That means making sure small acreage, minority, underrepresented, and under-resourced producers have the support they need to be successful as well. If we can be successful in crafting practical policies, we can reduce carbon pollution and create new sources of revenue for family foresters, which I think is really a, a, a terrific opportunity for us. I hope that each of you and your organizations will continue to lead on this issue, and I look forward to having our committee work with you as we move forward. In addition, uh, the record will remain open for five business days for members to submit additional questions or statements. The hearing is adjourned. <laughs>